so yes, what I want to talk about is this prop here. This is a, an axe by Leo. And this thing has basically been dynamesh at high resolution so that um, you know everything is still visible, all the details are there, but basically this is like a seamless shell. So if you were to if you were to continue sculpting, right, you could sort of seamlessly sculpt through from uh, handle blade to axe head. Yeah, so the reason why I'm doing this is that it's oftentimes easier for, for simple props or if you're gonna have multiple props that are gonna be maybe not featured, uh, we want to have them become a simple sort of shell, solid shell shape. It's just easier to manage in a scene with lots of props or if it's a, more of a background object that's not so important. So dyna meshing together is helpful. And one of the reasons uh, that's also an issue, um, unfortunately I don't have a tablet pen, but I'll just uh, use my crude uh, mouse skills in uh, Photoshop. So if you have multiple <laughs> layers, um, multiple props, so let's say you've got, uh, I'll just kind of draw a couple of different surfaces here. Um, yeah, there we go. So let's say we have a surface and then it's got like a screw or a bolt on it. Okay, and then um, our low res prop, so I'll kind of like roughly draw it this way. The way ZBrush handles this is that we take the, the, the new low res and we project. So what projection is going to say is, hey, let's compare the two surfaces. So I'll switch that color. right? So it's going to kind of compare the two surfaces and try to match the red one to the previous one. <coughs> so that's you know sculpting detail, whatever. The problem is that when there's overlapping mesh, maybe I should have done this right on another layer. <laughs> uh, OK, so let's say that new mesh. OK. The problem is. Um, that when you project, which is literally sort of saying, hey, let's wrap the new new low res, maybe with divisions around the high res, it can make really confusing mistakes where it's like, do I do I project to this the screw or to the to the underlying subtool that's between that? So it doesn't know which surface, you know, and you can get sort of like spikes in the mesh. Um, or and if you raise the the distance slider, you can kind of get maybe this angle will be projected awkwardly over here. So it becomes really, really messy. So that's one of the reasons why if I'm using ZBrush, I'll try, like if the thing has a simple enough silhouette, I'll try to kind of make it one solid surface via DynaMesh. Um, one of the good things about this, I'll say, is that um, if, you're, if you do have a high res with many subtools and it's fairly complex, um, you can simplify the process by literally just merging all the high res tools and exporting a high res mesh. And then either, we'll talk a bit about that a bit later on, but like, let's say collapsing things down to uh, a low res or having a low res, just simply exporting it. So sometimes it'll be the base of the model, that's still good. So, you know, sometimes when you start an axe handle, it's actually very much like a cylinder, let's say, right? And the head is very much like a cube. So if you had that original kind of rough blocking from Maya or that you did in ZBrush, that could work. Um, and so uh, Substance Painter, just generally speaking, handles many multiple subtools, both in the high res and the low res, much better. It's a little bit more challenging, I find, to deal with that in ZBrush for baking textures and normals. Um, so this is just my method of at least simplifying things down via the ZBrush method, which uh, I want to show you next. So um, yeah, I think one of the important steps was making sure there's no gaps between, let's say, these the sort of metal bar on the side and the, the, the wood axe handle. And same thing here, there's kind of a big uh, gap or cavity in this region. And by the way, you can sort of, you know, smooth that out or, or, or touch it up if, if there is some issues in there. Um, okay, so that, that looks pretty decent overall. Um, <coughs> just because when we have things what are, that are called undercuts, which is sort of like, like this area where basically, um, you know, the low rise surface is going to come up here and then come across almost straight, right? It may be hard for the projection to pick that up when we do project all. So I'll show you my process for roughly translating this, this object. Um, again, this has already been done where it's basically been all the high-res parts have been merged together and dynameshed together. Um, so usually what I do is I'll take a second step to this, which is to duplicate this dynameshed model. Okay. And um, in this case, there are polygroups, which, which can be useful. Sometimes they may be distracting. So uh, I'm just going to take a look at this with line mode on. Um, the reason why it might be distracting is sometimes the polygroups will, will kind of really hurt a Z remeshing 
when they're really small, like let's say in this area. So sometimes you may want to consider potentially regrouping. So I'm going to just hide this area. And just to simplify that top part, I'm going to just hit Control W, which makes that uh, a polygroup. Okay. So I think I would probably do roughly the same thing through here. So Control Shift click. Looks like there's some other stray groups in there. And uh, I'll probably just make this whole thing a polygroup. And it looks looks like there are some you know kind of stray bits here and there. So I'm going to just hit Control W. And I'm doing this with a flat color on, which can also be helpful. Again, there's a bunch of little bits that sometimes are left behind um, via you know dynameshing or whatever. So, so again, I'm really really just simplifying the the polygroups at this point. Um, Control W. Now, one additional thing you can do, uh, I would say, is that you can also maybe do a slice down the middle of the object. So I'll switch to Skin Shade 4 instead of Flat Color. So you could, in theory, uh, come through with something like a, um, a slice brush. So slice is not going to collapse part of the mesh. And we can uh, just adjust like so. And what that will do is keep basically subgroups, but then kind of split through the mesh. I, it does look like the model itself is also slightly maybe rotated off axis, which does make this a little bit more challenging. So you could try to fix that. <coughs> and before I do, I think what I want to do, because I've got the high and the low res, or my potential low res sitting here, um, I think I want to fix them both at the same time. So my solution for that is to go into Z plugin, transpose master, go to T pose mesh. Because again, I don't want to have to then like slightly tweak and try to match my rotations across both objects. So I'm going to go to rotate like so, and I think that's pretty decent. Okay. So back to trans from transpose back to subtools. So both will kind of now snap into position without me having to awkwardly try to get that to work. Okay. So again, once you click on Slice Curve, uh, the default for Control Shift is Select Rectangle, which is that visibility brush you see me use. Uh, but there's sort of certain categories, and I kind of keep them clustered together. So Select Rectangle, Select Lasso, Slice Curve, Trim Curve, uh, Clip Curve are part of this sort of same set uh, of curves or within this sort of curve family. So I'm, I'm roughly trying to get a fairly straight line through here. Doesn't have to be perfect. I'm trying to get close to perfect, but we'll see. You know, um, I think I'm okay with that for now. I'll try to live with it. So, what's great about this is that putting, let's say, for something like that's kind of thin and flat like this too, uh, putting a uh, a slice like that through is going to help with uh, not only Z remeshing, but then if I unwrap this thing, I, I probably want to, you know, be able to. Um, there, I'll get a better slice. I think this way. Yeah, that's a lot better. Much sharper. Right, because you imagine uh, usually you have to split things when you when you do unwraps. So um, in this case, this works out good. So I'm going to turn my line option back on for for this, and as a kind of in between step, um, I'm going to dynamesh this at a lower resolution. So if you take a look at the resolution here, it's like 2,000, almost 3,000. If I drop this down to maybe like 1,500 and uh, control click and drag, let me just solo this. It's at 500,000. Okay. By the way, notice something happened here. My, my polygroups have disappeared, which is a problem. And I, I'm going to explain why that happens. On the, um, on, the sub -tool, I, uh, there's, on the sub tool itself, there's a list of icons. The icon just to the left of the, of the object here has a paintbrush on. When that is activated and you dynamesh, you wind up losing polygroups. So you want to turn that off. And now I'll re-dynamesh. And this should keep the groups but drop the resolution. Um, so just keep that in mind if, if that does happen to you or if that kind of pops up that that might be the reason why. Um, so I find like if you're at a half a million polys or less it's much faster to dynamesh whereas if your model is um, or Z remesh sorry from a dynamesh. If your model is like 2 million, 5, 10, 20 million or plus uh, higher than that and you try to Z remesh that it can take a long long time to process and is much more likely to crash. So a lot of times I'll just do a very rough um, you know, and I can go even lower. I could have, let's say, Dynamesh this even lower to like 160,000. You will see the polygroups start to look rougher and rougher. So 
um, you know, you might want to hold off on that. So at this point, I'm at half a million down from the original, what was it, 1.8 mil, so that's not too bad. And what I'm going to do next is um, to simply turn off Dynamesh and Z Remesh. And I usually like to go in half, and I'll say Keep Groups, and I turn off Adapt. Adaptive Density, what it's doing, again, if you hold Control over any button or um, slider in ZBrush, it'll tell you what it's doing. So basically, Adaptive Density, um, it'll sort of detect areas of more detail and put more mesh where it belongs but I'm going for a specific poly count and I'm going to get that detail back via normals anyways so I'll turn off adapt and I'll hit Z remesh by the way smoothing <laughs> smooth groups is turned on so what that means is like the 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 edge um, the gap sorry uh, what do I say the border between poly groups will get increasingly smooth so if you have something that's really really sharp and you want to maintain that sharpness you may want to turn the slider down or set it to zero and by the way, you know, sometimes this happens, you, we get kind of like little messy spots, uh, and that's okay. Like, I, I can um, either try to smooth that out and then zero mesh in half again. Okay. Um, so let that process. Uh, by the way, it's giving me an error. So if you ever do encounter errors, and this sometimes happens, I'm going to go to mesh editing and go to check mesh, and there is an error there. Fix mesh. I usually like to optimize as well if there are errors, just to kind of minimize potential future errors. So I'll zero mesh again. So um, another thing that pops up too is that, like I said, sometimes like as we're zero meshing, the, the, the shape or the profile starts to pull off. As you can see here, the tip is kind of pulling off. Again, it's not going to matter because once I get the poly count low enough, I can always nudge things around and I'm going to project. Basically meaning project is like saying copy. Copy paste the um, you know, one shell of the mesh to the other shell of, uh, of this new mesh. So again, I'm just continuing to go in half. And um, you know, again, if things are a little bit concerning in terms of shape, you can always smooth, you can always do a little bit. Sometimes I'll Z model or something like, um, yeah, let's say in here, I might just go through and slice this. I'll go with the slice brush again, just to um, <coughs> help those polygroups there um, figure out that there's, there's another curve there. So when you Z remesh again in half, um, there, you know, we've kind of got more, more or less the edge that we sort of need. But again, this might be pulling off quite dramatically from the surface. Um, so another way to check this is to go to opacity. And so if you see a major, uh, let's say, change, you can always use something like your move brush and pull the shapes into where they need to be. Um, so usually I'll just do a little bit of gentle kind of uh, uh, tweaking and adjusting here. So that's one thing that also the that sort of smooth groups does is it sort of like um, it can pull the shapes off of other areas. But again, it's not so bad that we can't uh, fix this through you know projection and stuff. So uh, like I said, with the the axe head here, this is under ten thousand. This is the poly count that I'm I was hoping to reach. So I'm just kind of smoothing and then pulling this thing back. So at this point, I would hit Project All. So I wanted to just show you this with Solo Mode on. So when I do Project All, you'll see things kind of snap up. Project All, right? And it suddenly will sort of start to snap up to the to the shape that's there. You know, one thing I should be a little careful of is I, I do generally want my, uh, let's say the edge here is not quite flowing along the way I'd like it to. So I could pull maybe some of these edges down a bit. Maybe smooth the flat side a little bit because I, I want the X head, the X handle, I want that all to kind of fit quite well. So just kind of making sure the edges flow along, let's say, the bottom edge of that axe or the, the blade itself, project all. So you can sort of smooth and then reposition and project all. And again, I'm not sure what's happening there. So I'll jump out of solo for a second. Yeah, maybe I'll pull this stuff down a bit. Smooth, pull it down. And again, if you feel like you need <laughs> more mesh in a certain area, you can always uh, put in an extra edge loop or um, make another adjustment. Project all. Okay. So that's that's kind of I think a decent first step. Getting that shell to kind of fit and fit well. If there are major gaps, because sometimes this will happen, I'll, I'll show you what sort of happens if that is the case. When you go to project all, parts of it may snap in and parts of it may be left behind. Which can be this, you know, you sort of if so if you ever see that. 
chances are you want to go into um, solo mode. I usually smooth it out and then just manually use, use a, a large move brush. And I usually hold alt. It pulls the, the mesh in the direction that the polygon's already facing. And you want to just kind of get it within a close enough range so that when you hit projectile, it will snap right into that surface. Also, if you do have uh, multiple parts, um, you want to go maybe part by part. So <coughs> somebody had like a lampshade and a lamp base, do the lampshade on its own, then do the lamp base on its own. So you duplicate the lampshade, for example, if it's a high poly, remesh it or dynamesh it lower, remesh, and then project just those two parts. So you turn off the visibility of the other parts in the scene. Um, again, this is why I, I tried to suggest for this assignment, at least it's your first project in ZBrush. Keep it simple. Make it a, a prop that can essentially become one shell, at least in the end. So uh, one of the other issues I'll mention is that we, we don't have the high-res detail. So this is where I would sort of say you can fork uh, and decide, am I going to export this as a low-res to Unreal or um, use the ZBrush method? So um, either way, we do need to unwrap this thing. So I, I love this uh, for the speed and simplicity, but you can go to UV Master, Polygroups, Unwrap. And if we go to flatten, okay, we'll see the UVs are basically done, which is quite nice. Now, I don't like the waste of space here, so I would typically um, go Z this to Maya. So if you keep this sort of tool active, by the way, I should probably actually unflatten before doing that. So yeah, what's, what's kind of weird about ZBrush in a lot of ways, like when you do that flatten mode, it, it's showing you what the UV's layout, uh, layout looks like, but it's actually literally splitting the mesh temporarily into these flattened groups. So uh, it's ideal if you make sure you just go back and unflatten and then go Z it. Um, and that should hopefully update correctly. So yeah, if you want to fix UVs, I find um, ZBrush is, or uh, Maya is pretty good for this. So we can just sort of take all our shells Usually I'll go into my layout options, so I want to set this to 4K. I've already set saved these settings, so these are kind of my recommended settings. 4K for the texture map size, 4K for pack, packing resolution, uh, rotate shells, translate shells, and I, I basically allow it to rotate in 15 degree steps. So if, once we hit layout, it should uh, try to fairly quickly and automatically um, <coughs> basically give me a, a pre-done layout. Now, I still sometimes have to hand lay things out if I'm not happy with the results. And it can be a little bit awkward to to get good UVs with a very, very long object. So like really long swords, really long staffs. Um, it, it, sometimes we have to uh, try to um, pack those long things into right a very square set of UVs. Um, and that can be a bit tricky. So sometimes you will split UVs, but I, I usually like to kind of split them where there are natural seams. One of the reasons, just to explain that, is that um, you know having seams in UVs is not ideal. Or if we have seams, we want to potentially avoid them because um, you know we're just not sure if the seams may become visible visible at some point. And some, sometimes they do become visible just because of uh, rendering software or strange issues or glitches. Let's say 3D is full of them. So um, yeah, it's good to, to kind of try to place seams in a natural, a natural area where they would typically occur. So again, you can sort of see I'm only using half the, uh, the UV space, sadly. So um, you know, that's where I you know, might go in and tweak things. I think I probably want to also, let's say these two shells, sometimes the shell split doesn't make sense down the middle. Um, we usually want our edges to be sort of split along the major areas here, so I might sort of split this off. I'll go to uh, Shift, right click, cut, and then if I take, uh, you know, let's say this edge down to here. Yeah, let's go this way. Uh, I'll Shift, right click, go to move and sew. Okay, so now that's basically a shell here, right? That top piece, and I do roughly the same with the bottom. Uh, looks like I accidentally attached the, uh, yeah, I didn't want to attach that part, so I'll just uh, deselect that for now. Okay. Moving so, there we go, and then shell. Uh, same thing here, I'll take these, uh, so you can go into UV shell as well. This makes kind of selections easy in Maya. 
So yeah, I'll just take the, the edge here, shift, double click along the middle, and then go to shift, right click, move and sew. So again, you know, I've got a couple of options. I can either make the ax head maybe much bigger. So sometimes we can disproportionately scale parts of the model. I usually recommend making things proportionate unless certain parts are going to be in close up. Uh, the other thing I might do is that, you know, I feel like I might unfortunately have to uh, sort of select through the middle of the ax handle and put a seam in. But I would say like more and more, um, it's, it's actually okay to have seams in, in clearly visible spots. Just because the, the 3D software these days and baking and stuff like that has gotten pretty good. So we don't necessarily have to worry so much about uh, about seams, but I still do. I, I guess that's my old school <laughs> kind of nature kicking in, but uh, there we go. So I'm just going to move in soap because this can pretty much be like one big flat patch essentially and the same thing. So, you know, I'm eliminating one seam because I had to make another move and sew. And then usually like the bottom area because this is like a cylinder so you want to imagine the cylinder right you want to kind of cut the tops and bottoms off so I will take that probably this here and go to cut and we'll take this move and sew and then what's this piece here yeah along here so the UV shells right now they're they're very warped they're not you know through the cutting and sewing and stuff but if I go back here and shift right click and go to uh, unfold Again, in my unfold options, I turn on layout UVs automatically, so it's kind of doing a lot of that rotation and stuff. Also, if you have issues with your mesh, sometimes your mesh is a little bit buggy, you can turn on fixed non-manifold geometry, so it's actually auto-fixing the mesh if an error pops up, and then going back. Now, I don't usually turn this on because I usually like to find and fix the errors myself or use uh, the mesh, mesh cleanup option over here uh, with settings, so that's why I don't normally turn that on, but we should see the unwrap actually get a lot better in terms of using or maximizing the space. Uh, the reason is, is that you don't want to kind of just use half a UV texture space, like just because you're still pulling up the pixels, right? That 4K uh, square texture is still going to cost you the same amount in terms of memory, right? When it comes to rendering, when it comes to something else. So you might as well put pixels in there instead of not putting uh, detail in. So that's why we really want to take advantage of every single pixel. Uh, and unwrapping wise, you know, even that these days is getting really wild. Like people are just stretching their UV shells to just completely fit and pack in the space pretty much. Um, so you're not wasting anything. Uh, but in this case, for me, it's just more generally about minimizing any wasted space uh, and not necessarily having to warp it. Because again, um, Substance and other software will kind of bake things out. Okay, and by the way, you can turn on this little checker thing here to see how things are. Now, what the checker is meant to, to sort of show you is that if it becomes non-square, that means you have distortion somewhere in the mesh or the uh, in the unwrapping. And right now, to me, this looks pretty good. Um, it's pretty decent. Again, I, I don't have kind of the maximum amount of usage here in terms of space, so I think what I'm going to do is scale up the these sort of major parts, and s I'll disproportionately scale them and then select the rest. This time when I go back into layout, I'm going to go into options. So there's something called uh, shell pre-scaling. So what that means is that with this off, it doesn't, uh, it'll reset the proportions so that every UV edge and face and polygon is proportionally the same size as it is on the mesh, meaning it resets the scaling. So if I turn this on to uh, preserve 3D ratios, or sorry, I should leave it off. I think by default it's actually on preserve 3D ratios. Preserve 3D ratios will say, look at the model and say, okay, the shell should be proportionally the same size as they are in the actual model. But with this off, I can kind of keep uh, keep this uh, disproportionate scaling for the kind of the main part of the axe head and the handle. Um, so that's that's a useful option. So just take another moment to uh, to process. Less wasted space, which is good. So again, I can probably go back here and scale these up even more. You know, you can also manually place these. So sometimes I'll just go into UV um, UV shell and just kind of move things in by hand. You can do that, but uh, I find it can be a little bit uh, long to go that way. So I'd much rather try to let the tool do like 80 to 100 percent of the lifting for me and if I have to jump in at the end I will. 
So while that's calculating, I'll just talk a little bit about this. So uh, method, I would say method one with ZBrush is um, you basically, um, maybe I'll just type this out, it might be nicer. Um, copy mesh, remesh, um, usually it's good to unwrap, divide, and project. So that's kind of where I'm going with this right now. Um, okay, so that'd be like method one. Um, yeah, it's not quite working the way I want this to, so I'll, uh, I'm not sure. I think maybe I do have to turn on that option, actually. Let me go back in. Anyways, I'll, uh, I'll pretend this is okay. <laughs> Scale that up. Yeah, always good too when you're doing UVs to kind of give room to your um, to each shell because we we want to do what or what I typically do with my uh, shells is that I will um, do what's called a, a kind of like border or bleed on these. So you know I I want to maximize the space that I'm using, but I also want to minimize uh, any overlap. So I, I definitely can't have any overlap uh, in here. Okay, so. Yeah, I'm going to have to put that piece, I think, over there. And that also could have been the challenge I think maybe the algorithm was having is sort of like trying to fit things in a way that sort of makes sense. Can be a bit of a challenge for sure. So sometimes what I'll do as well is I'll try to like figure this out a different way. There, and then I'll sort of start to uh, put the pieces of the puzzle back together, like so. Okay, and then what you can do is actually take all of this and sort of scale it down, and then reposition from there, okay? So it's not, uh, not the end of the world if things don't fully kind of work at first. And if you feel like, you know, sometimes too, so the, the manual method, I feel like if, you know, if there's space that's not being used, again, I'll, I'll scale back up the parts that, that could be scaled back up and then reposition them, okay? So so try not to waste, all of it is valuable real estate, so so don't, don't waste it if you can avoid it. Okay. Scale that up a bit. Okay, so that's pretty decent. Um, all right, so I'll take this, I'll just go Z it back. Uh, go Z. And you'll see, you know, the polygraphs might change color. What's interesting too is that if you wanted to, you could go into. Um, uh, in my custom interface, it's under um, sub tool organization. Uh, I think in uh, the regular interface on the right side, it's under polygroups, but you can go uh, auto group with UV. So it'll now basically recreate polygroups based on the UV. So now I've got you know where the handle split in the middle from the UV, where this bottom piece is split off. Okay, so back to projecting. So at this point, this is when I want to start <coughs> copying over the detail. The idea is that I can kind of ditch this DynaMesh model once I've projected every single scrap of detail from this um, badly laid out version to this more clean and newly laid out version. So I'm going to go to divide, which is control D, project all. And you can hit the divide under geometry division, divide. Okay, so you'll see that as I hit control D, project all, the detail comes through now, right? It transfers over, control D, project all.
Uh, again, if your if your original Dynamesh model is very high res, and then your Zeremesh divisions are really really high, it gets slower with each division. And we'll I usually like to flip around and look at this from different different colors. Okay, but the projection is looking good, and if I literally click back and forth, it's pretty pretty close. So this one's at f half a million. If I divide again. Control D. Sometimes I actually like to, to not project at the highest level because it does kind of soften. Maybe some some areas look maybe a little pixelated, right? Uh, either because the mesh was low, like this bolt section. Um, but here, after the final division, it actually looks a little bit more soft and rounded out. So sometimes that can be helpful. You can still project at this division, which is fine. Okay, so what ZBrush is doing, the, the way ZBrush handles it is it, it, it really is only looking at each subtool and its divisions for normal map creation. So now I can literally go back to the original here and probably just say uh, delete, okay? So what I've got now is pretty much all the information contained in my new low res in one subtool, but all that stuff from the Dynamesh version is, is here at uh, my fifth division level, and yet I've got you know a low res uh, prop, I've got all that. So what's great about this, what I really love about this way of working is that um, I can make my texture maps and my UV map very, very quickly in here. So I'm going to set it to 4K. This map border thing, so I usually set this to 16 pixels. So what happens sometimes is if you're smoothing a mesh in Maya through smooth preview, what can happen is that uh, sometimes they're stretching and on the seams of the UVs it'll start to s split apart and so what what the texture map border of 16 pixels is going to do is kind of extend the edge of the normal maps or any painted maps any 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 maps will be extended by 16 pixels beyond the UV shell borders um, so that way if there's ever any weird glitch in your game engine or your rendering software uh, you can potentially avoid having to go back and rebake every texture so it's kind of a preventative measure for future bugs okay so that 16 pixel border is going to over render essentially. It's really just extending out the border uh, of the UV shell. Now if I go to normal map, I literally just have to hit create normal map. Usually when I'm making these, I don't turn on adaptive, but I will in this case, it's a slower render. And by default, smooth UVs and smooth normals is on. So again, if you're smooth previewing or dividing the mesh in Maya afterwards, you definitely want those two options on and we want this to be a tangent based normal map which is basically that kind of blue purple looking texture map so so what it's doing is you have to be at your low res your lowest division level and it's sort of comparing that that same subtool with itself so it's saying what does the high res the highest division level with all its sculpting or painting or whatever look like and then let's compare it to the low res uvs which you see here and let's bake that out basically so I'll hit go z and we should pop back over to Maya. And if I hit six on my keyboard, that will allow us to see the texture, which is there. Um, by default, uh, this is something I think they need to fix in the tool, but uh, you know, it should be either like a blend or a fong material. That's one thing. And then the second thing is we have to go into the bump map itself and set it from uh, color space sRGB into raw. And then usually as well, I, I like my um, my kind of color to be pretty dark gray on that object. So then if I look around at this thing, right, it looks really good. And that's our sub 10,000 you know, polygon axe with the 2 million poly uh, detail. So I mean, I think that's a pretty good result. And the other great thing is uh, if we go to Windows, or sorry, uh, Display, Heads Up Display, Poly Count, it's 8,000 polys, and if you hit three on your keyboard, that is going to smooth out the axe, right? It's going to actually give you kind of a preview, um, a smooth preview. So again, this thing is dividing twice. That's the default when you hit three on your keyboard. It's smooth previewing the mesh, meaning this 8,000 becomes, uh, what is that, times four? Like 32,000, and then 32,000 times four is about 13, uh, 136,000, okay? So um, what's great is that you kind of get uh, if I hit Alt B here, right, you get that nicer sort of silhouette that's cleaner. Uh, and even without it, you know, it still looks pretty good at that low res. And if you wanted to, sometimes I do this under, um, again, this is where the preview option is when you hit one or three. It's literally just flicking this icon off or on. And if you hit page up or down, page down will lower the preview resolution. So it's only smoothing once instead of twice. Um, it doesn't change the default, but it changes it on that particular mesh. 
So sometimes that's useful again if you have a lot of objects in a heavy scene. So you still get a nice silhouette, but um, we're not loading the scene with heavy preview smooth mesh. And it's, it's still only 34,000. So much, much lighter compared to right the 2 million, 3 million, whatever it might be on this object. So that, that applies to props as well as any other object. 